What's going on people? I'm very stoked because today is roughly about a year that I have my flyboard and almost a thousand miles. Actually 970 miles that I have on my board. I'm gonna make it 1,000 miles today. So this video I'm making is more to give you some pointers and tips uh, for who has the board or who's about purchasing it to buy it. Some tips and gadgets that I've done to my board to improve it and make it last longer. Now in my gadget board is gonna be nothing about writing or anything like that. But we're gonna cover things, things like uh, how to carry the board, uh, how to put in the water depending on, on, the, on the place that you are, and things about how to take care of your board, your controller, and especially your battery, how to recharge it, because Flyboard doesn't cover it that much about how to re, uh, recharge your battery, because if you don't know how to preserve your battery well and recharge it, it actually might lose a little bit of uh, its uh, uh, performance. All right, so if you're patient enough, stick around, and I'm gonna show the tips that I learned with my board and talk with around people who has the board as well. So I hope you enjoy the video. Now I'm starting with uh, how I like to how I like to carry my board. I found this to be the easiest way because uh, there's not much weight that you're going to be carrying and awkward. Uh, I never put the bar bear inside the board. I keep the bear outside. Outside, but the best way that to carry for me at least is that I put my board on my right shoulder. Luckily, I have my PFD, and if you have the PFD, you can just put a piece of rag or so forth. So once I put the, the board on my side, I go to the side of the of the mast, hold that right there, and then simply grab the battery with the other hand. And that way, it's nice and simple for you to carry. Now, uh, you can carry any other way, but I find this to be a much more control of the board, having one weight in one side and weight in the other. I'm in Boston, Massachusetts, so today is nice. It's about 55 degrees out. However, the water is at 35, 39 degrees, so it sucks. But uh, now I'm using a deck start, a dock start, rather than the beach. I'm gonna talk about the board itself now. I'm used to surfing and sub surfing, so the sub boards they usually make it out of, of a epoxy and they're much stronger. I'm not saying that fly board is not a strong material, it's not a strong board being, being um, uh, out of a carbon fiber, but it is somewhat not as tough as a sub board. So, what I found that helped me a lot is that on the nose, as you can see, I put a sub SUP, a SUP nose guard. Because you usually put the board like this on the ground anyways. So I put a SUP nose guard on the front. And on the back, I also just bought a, um, a piece of foam or deck pad that you can glue to the back as well. And you're gonna know why I did this. Now, with that said, um, fly board as well. Uh, you gotta understand that you're gonna get a little nicks and cranks, gonna bang against the door. And I tried as much as I could to keep it nice and safe. And I had some damages, of course. Now, um, things like this, you okay with it? But sometimes, look at that. That's a major crack right there. So what I did, uh, I just put a, a, a clear tape on it so the water doesn't come in. Eventually, I'm gonna bring in and fix this board. But a little place like this where it got little dings and dings, like right there, this is prone to, to, to have water infiltration best way to do is like when you do a surfboard if you get a crack like this you put your mouth suck it in and if you know our air comes out that means you're good but if the air in water comes out that means you, you the board is it, it might, might be infiltrating water so what happens is with time the water that gets in uh, it will damage the foam and eventually this whole area over here is gonna be soft so we're gonna keep eye for that so that's why I put these things there's one over here there's another one over here and there's another one right there. You can see there's a little bit of condensation there. But eventually I'm gonna bring the board to any surf shop so they can do a little repair to the whole board. But so far so good. So nose guard, and you can find this stuff, uh, back guard, uh, which is basically um, a, a, uh, a the same pad that you use on the board. And the clear tape, just in case we get dings and dings. And all that stuff you can find at uh, Amazon. Just do a search. Now, let me talk about the compartment. Another quick tip that I want to give to you is this, is the magnetic key. So what I do basically, 
I got this uh, heavy duty uh, fishing line, 300 pounds fishing line, and I keep it there all the time. So the only thing I gotta do is put it over here, and once the board connects, what I do afterwards is just bring it to the side and you're done. However, make sure that you're not gonna leave this key over here because it's gonna go against the lid and it might not close completely. Just make sure once you connect it, you're done. You'll be surprised that with the space that you have over here, you can actually carry some tiny things, like I can put my, my car key over here, uh, camera, and I can actually put a GoPro right inside over there, or what I'm using right now, which is my 360 degree camera, and it fits in there. As long as you turn everything off, it'll be okay. It doesn't raggle at all. So you can actually use this room for space. I wish the actually fireboard probably made this a little more boxy so it could actually fit in more stuff. But that space right there, at least for you to carry your kit or your car key, works pretty well. So now here's a little silly thing that you didn't know and fireboard doesn't tell you. That controller does not float. Now, yeah, granted, you have a wrist strap, wrist strap, and you're probably never gonna lose it, and it's pretty strong. However, let's say if you have on the deck on the boat, and the thing falls in the water, it will sink, and that's four hundred twenty dollars for you to replace it. Four hundred twenty dollars right here. So what I did is once again Amazon searching wrist strap flotation. Boom, yeah, I got that. And you can just throw it in the water, and you're never gonna lose your um, your controller anymore. Now. I'm not making commercials for, for Amazon, but it's pretty much good. Whenever you go over there, you can find anything that you want. Don't take this for granted, guys, because it's $420. Not only that, if you lose this in the middle of the water, how are you gonna get back to shore? I also have a review online about the uh, True Glide prop, uh, the prop. But here's the deal. I always use my normal prop. With the True Glide prop, it only happened once that actually the prop, it, for some reason, it damaged and it was spinning freely, meaning no matter how much power I gave, uh, how much po power I gave to the motor, the, the prop wouldn't spin. So for that reason, uh, and they, I sent to Flyboard and they couldn't tell me what happened to the prop itself, but it just, it fell on me. Luckily, I was right here, just about 15 feet away and was able to swim back. However, if that had happened, uh, uh, sometimes I go eight miles out that happened in a place like that I'll be screwed so for me at least uh, I only use the true glide prop when I am surfing so I'm close to the shore and if something happens I can always swim back but my prop my my propeller to go through is definitely the standard propeller because it's bulletproof nothing's gonna go wrong with it and um, as I said I'm sure there's no other case out there that happened like but this really happened to my the, the, the free glide, two glide propeller, it just, it didn't work. One time, it snapped and that was it. The propeller was still attached. However, I don't take that risk. If I'm way out in the ocean, I'm way out far, five miles away, how am I gonna get back, you know? So I, my, my recommendation to you is always use the regular standard propeller and we're never gonna go surfing because it will be closer to the shore to use the two glide propeller. So I switch between both of them. Now, one thing that happened to me too is that um, it might happen to you guys in the past or some of you guys. So this is a stab that I had before. I was on the beach uh, surfing, so I was putting it into my board on the surf. So basically, I was barely high, which is clear. I was clear for the fact that I knew that I was going to touch the bottom. But as I was going up, still just slowly cruising, a wave came up, it pushed me up, and I came down on my back of my board with this hitting the ground really hard. And look what happened. I bent the shaft. So that was pretty hardcore. You can see the bend right there. And when that happens, you can barely ride these things anymore. Now, the only thing I did, I just switched this with $70 and bought a new one. However, you gotta be really careful with this part over here because if you, if you bend over here, it's okay you can just buy another one. However, if you bend this area over here, that means you gotta change the whole shaft and this is about $3,500, $3,500 if you bend this over here. If you bend this area over here, you're gonna have to change the whole mast, which is gonna cost you $3,500. So be really careful when you go in on the beach break, even though you're gonna be clear above your chest water, if a wave comes in, it's gonna make you go nose up 
and most likely you're gonna come down your tail really hard on the angle and you will bend this. But you wanna try as much as you can to bend this shaft right there of the, the, the mast. This is the easiest way I found to be for me to get my board out of the water on a water level dock. I grab the board by the nose and the handle and then I sink deeply in the water and I use the buoyancy rebound of the board to bring it to the dock. And that's why I have that back pad over there on the back of the board. Now it's very awkward when you have a deck that's about two foot high from the water. So the best way here is as follow. I grab the board by the nose and the handle again, but this time I square it against my knees. Then I pull the board on the top of my foot so the weight rests on my foot. And then finally, I lay down and bring the board on the top of me. And then slowly, I slide the board on this side nice and gently so it doesn't damage. Now, to get back in the water on the high deck, you do the same reverse way. You lay down next to the board, you put the board in your chest, slide down to your knees and then finally to your feet once you put in your feet you can finally get the weight of the board and then you can just lean forward and the board will be in the water That's it. so basically now this is how i get out of the water on a shallow dock i line up with the dock and then slow down until i get to number level one and as the board starts slowing down and sinking i just basically put my hands on the dock and I roll down on my back and I sit down, keeping my feet on the board so it doesn't get away from me. And this is it. Sorry for making such a long video, guys, uh, but uh, you know I'm trying to help you as much as I can. I just got out of the water right now, and finally now I want to talk about the battery. So, uh, Flyboard never really tells you how to charge your battery. Just tell it to plug on, plug in, and whatnot. However, I did my own research about uh, uh, lithium battery, and you can find this information on the internet, on Google, whatever, and the best way to preserve your lithium battery. Every lithium battery for anything, from computers to cars to, you know, flyboards, whatever, for e-foils, it will lose its capacity every year. So they say anything between three to 7%, you'll be losing the capacity of that battery every year. Now. There are ways that you can do to preserve that battery for longer. Once again, Flyboard doesn't get in detail about that, but I did my own research and after doing a lot of research, I realized the perfect steps for you to preserve that battery. Now, let me tell you the big no-no's. The big no that you don't wanna do, you do not wanna run your chop battery all the way to the minimum. I've done that before several times to the point that I exhaust my battery to zero. Uh, and I had to swim back like, you know, 10, 10 yards back to the dock. So you definitely don't want to do that. Uh, two, once you bring your battery back to recharge, make sure your battery is a little bit cooled off. You don't want to charge your battery when it's still warm. Uh, three, you do not want to charge your battery all the way to the top in one charge. You do not want to do that. And those are the things that you want to do. Now, let me tell you my protocol that I do to make sure my battery is going to last longer. And after a lot of research, that's what I found out that works the best. One, of course, as I said, you want to be uh, going back to the shore once you're about 20%. You do not want to run your battery below 15 and 20% of, of uh, uh, riding. I know it sucks about 15 minutes riding, but I better rather do that than waste my battery. So don't run below 20% to 15%. Two, when you bring your battery to recharge, make sure the battery is cool and then once you recharge it, do not recharge it all the way up. Do not, do not top it off. You want to recharge only about 35 to 50% max. Now, unfortunately, the, the uh, uh, flight cell doesn't, show, doesn't tell you the percentage, but does show you the blinking lights. Uh, what I do is that I, I charge for only about 50 minutes, 45, 50 minutes, and I wait until the second uh, blinking light start blinking. Once that second blinking light start blinking, that's when I turn off the uh, the charger, unplug the charger, which is for me is about 45 to 50 minutes. Now, once you take that off, you want to still keep the magnet plate on the uh, battery because right now what you're doing once you leave the, the, the magnet plate on, you, you keep the battery on and now the cells are leveling out every single cell energy and keep it even. And now that was one thing that uh, one of the servicemen 
from uh, Flyboard. Actually, my buddy Steve told me that we should do that. Once you charge your battery, you should leave that magnet on for about six hours to eight hours to level up the cells. So you recharge until 50%. Then you you uh, leave the magnet for about six to eight hours. Then you take, take the magnet out and you're set for three, four or five days, whatever you wanna do for storage. Then once you're gonna go riding, next step you wanna do is top it off the battery all the way up and once you finish topping off, you still leave that magnet key on until you go riding, which is gonna be whatever time we're gonna have to do. So to sum it up, never, uh, uh, one, uh, ride your battery only no less than 20%. Two, once you um, charging, charge your battery only up to 40, uh, 35 to 50%. And once you unplug the battery, leave the magnet on for at least eight hours. Then once you're gonna recharge again to go, top it off the battery uh, on the day that you're gonna uh, 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 use it and leave the magnet on until you hit the water. And those are the precautions you wanna have, the protocol you wanna have to make your battery last a little longer. This is it guys, thank you very much for sticking out until the end. I know it was a long video and probably boring, but I hope uh, the tips that I gave to you was helpful enough for you to make sure that you're gonna take better care of your flyboard and enjoy it for much longer. Uh, please leave the comments below. I always like to interact with you guys and I always like to get to know you guys who are using the same uh, toys that I'm using. Now, if you like my content, please subscribe. Thank you very much for your time again. Be good to each other and I'll see you around, see you in the water. Take care, guys.